Okay, everyone, please know that you are being recorded for quality assurance. And so, <clears throat> so just kind of bringing up the, uh, the, the thing here. Uh, actually, give me one second. Once I start the sharing, it messes up my screens. All right, so um, one of the things that was asked is for the, um, on the midterm exam, do they have to include on the Excel the stove in the uh, in the refrigerator, and the answer is is that you're definitely going to want to, okay. And, and part of the reason for that is that if you did not include that, it's it's not going to calculate correctly. So, because um, remember, when you when you do a sale like this, you have to allocate, um, you have to allocate your uh, your amount your amounts received along your your adjusted basis, okay. Um, and actually, I do it based upon actual um, purchase price, because you sometimes what will end up happening is your, your adjusted basis will go down to zero because you'll be fully depreciated. So, for example, uh, the water heater is not fully depreciated. Uh, your stove is fully depreciated. So if you were to use adjusted basis as your way to allocate the AR, um, what will end up happening is that you, I mean, you would allocate zero to the stove, which would not be an accurate number. So my my thing, and I think I talked about it when we did the initial, um, when when I set it up initially, I said, hey, oops, sorry, I don't know why I did that. Um, when I did when I set it up initially, is I said go ahead and use the um, the actual cost basis and not the um, not the not the adjusted basis, because like I said, you may you may have a misallocation if that happens. So, all right. Any other questions about the, the test? Yeah, and if you haven't submitted your um, Excel sheet, make sure that you do submit that. I did notice one or two people had not submitted an Excel sheet, and so I'll be reaching out to them to say, hey, look, you need to submit your Excel sheet in order to get full credit for, the, uh, for that portion of the exam. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry. Somebody said, "Yeah." So when you email us, email of the exam, you need to email it to my um, my GMU email. And and part of the reason for that is GMU is responsible for having the the email service large enough in order to hold a lot of that stuff. Um, I, you know, I, I've had a couple of people who have emailed it to my business account. I'm, I'm I really wish you guys wouldn't do that because. It, it tends to clog up my business account. And actually, right now, I, I mean, I, I was taking a look at it this morning. Um, I'm up to 143 emails that I haven't read yet. So I'm not sure that I would be relying on me to uh, to do this. <laughs> you know, so, so we want to make sure that we go ahead and do that. So, um, Subject line, just do midterm exam. Somebody was asking me what should the subject line be, and and the answer is, uh, you know, I would just say midterm exam two would be very helpful because what's going to happen is I'm going to do a search for the midterm based on midterm exam. And I know this is going to sound kind of weird, but midterm, um, I've I've always done it as one word, but I've had some people who do it like. Some people do it this way. Some people do it this way. I t I tend to do all all one word or or even just midterm. Yeah, I mean, either one of these. What's going to happen is I'm going to do a search for all of these when I when I go through. And if I can't find your uh, your thing, then I'll actually search by your email. Uh, you know, before contacting you and say, hey, did you give me your midterm? And usually, I'll try to reach out to people before. Um, issuing a final grade, but, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I try to give you guys every opportunity to do everything that needs to be done. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, first part of class, uh, you know, last time we were kind of talking, I'm going to, because we, of, of the nature of what we're going through and, and how things are, um, I want to bring, and I thought I opened this this morning. Maybe I did not. Let's 
see. All right, so remember this is the example trial balance that we kind of used. And uh, as we had kind of talked about, you know, you start off, you know, you get an unadjusted trial balance from the, from the client. And then what happens is you will then have your, um, your adjusting journal entries that you're going to do. Remember, when you're, when you're doing adjusting journal entries, basically what you're doing is you're telling the client, hey, your books are not done correctly. I'm going to correct your books in order to, to get to the adjusted trial balance. With the adjusted trial balance, that actually allows you to, 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 to get to the point where this is kind of your starting point when you're, when you're doing your tax returns because you have to have a correct set of books in order to start. Your, um, after that, what happens is you'll have your, um, your, your I'm sorry, your, your tax journal entries, which is going to adjust your book income for taxable income. And once you have that set up, what will end up happening is, is you're going to come to two different numbers. You're going to have, well, first of all, you're going to have your, your trial balance by book, which is going to be this column here. And then you're going to have your trial balance by tax. Now, what we do when we build the tax return, uh, and this one actually I know I did not have set up, but I will do that. So going to Form 1120. And again, when we use Schedule L, it's going to be balance sheet per books. And so you want to follow the balance sheet per books. You, you, you'll put your numbers in. First of all, your beginning of your numbers. Basically, you're going to take the numbers that you had from the previous year and put them here. And then your numbers that you have at the end of the year are basically going to come from this green highlighted section that I have in the adjusted trial balance section. Okay, then you're going to put in your, your income and expenses, but the income and expenses are not gonna go onto this sheet here, they're gonna go on to page one of the return. And then what's gonna happen is you're gonna come down to a, a taxable income before net operating loss deductions and, and so on and so forth. And that number is going to more likely than not equal here. Now, there could be a couple times where you're going to be putting something in different areas of the tax return and then it, and how it will actually fill in. Um, everything that I'm telling you right here applies only to 1120s, which is the corporate tax return. Um, if, you, if you use the, uh, you know, the, the 1120, with the corporate tax return, that, that's going to apply. If you do the 1120S, what's going to happen is, is that there are certain aspects of the tax return. Uh, so actually, let me back up. So an 1120S is a, is a uh, an S corporation share uh, uh, tax return. S corporations are flow through entities. So what ends up happening is, is that the, um, the numbers are going to flow from your tax return onto your um, personal tax return. And what happens is that the Schedule K is going to actually diff, it's going to, it's going to break out those specific items that need to flow into different parts of the personal tax return. And we'll go over that when we talk about 1120Ss, but um, I, I just want you to know that when you put these green numbers into the tax return on page one, they should all go on page one. Uh, it's pretty stupid easy when you get it done. And then the cool thing I really like about, um, the, the cool thing that I really like about uh, corporate tax returns and partnerships and all that, you have the balance sheet. And so, you know, if you forget to put a number in there, it's not going to balance. And so you have to kind of figure out why that number doesn't balance. And so what will end up happening is, um, you know, you'll get to the end here. You'll have your, your, your book um, schedule L built. You'll have your income statement on the first part of the tax return built. And then what will end up happening is you go to this M1, which is located on uh, right below Schedule L. And this number right here, number one, box one and box 10, should line up with this number right here, which this will be box one. This will be box 10. Okay, and if you enter everything into the tax return correctly, that's all going to line up for you. Now, 
How do you enter it into the tax return software? That depends on the software that you use. That's going to be what's the, the responsibility of your firm to kind of train you in how to do that because um, initially, you know, in, and I want you to understand something. Your first year that you actually do all of this, it's going to be clumsy. You're going to make some mistakes. There, you know, you're going to put things into, you know, you, you're going to put things where you think that they should logically go, but because you haven't been using the actual tax return software for uh, your entire career, um, like some other people have, there, there are certain places that you're going to have to put certain numbers that you may not know about. Now, that is partially the responsibility of whoever is in charge of you when you first arrive at the firm to, in order to train you. I ain't going to lie to you. Not every firm is actually is um, not every firm is good at training people as much as they would like to say that they are. Okay, so I want you to make sure that when you're talking about um, uh, when you're when you're actually doing this, you want to make sure that you kind of latch on to somebody who can actually train you and and work with you. And and what's going to end up happening is when you get to the firm, you're going to kind of get a sense of who's good at training you and who is not. And you you probably want to hook up with that person uh, pretty quickly. And but that also kind of gets to another aspect of, of firm life. <clears throat> and that's that, you know, usually what happens with people is that in, in order to get promoted to higher levels of the organization, you kind of have to ride on coattails of individuals. Um, and the way that you start, you know, you, you start that relationship is that you have somebody who's willing to train you, but that you're willing to work hard for. And, and that's usually how you do it and how you succeed in firm life. <clears throat> um. Any questions so far about any of the trial balance uh, aspects of this before we get back to um, the slides? Okay, I don't see anybody's typing, so I will go ahead and we'll we'll move on. All right. So where we last stopped, we were trying to talk about dividends received deduction, kind of ran out of some time. I'm going to kind of go over this at the, at the 40,000 foot level because here's part of something that you need to understand. And, and I'm going to go back to our trial balance to kind of illustrate some of the stuff that we have here. Uh, let's see if I can pull it up. Okay, there it is. All right, so this is our trial balance. Now, look, I, I told you that there was miscellaneous income. We had dividend income and, and things of that nature. Um. And I, and I kind of told you that what you could do is that from a, from a book perspective, book doesn't really care whether you have interest and in, in dividend income bifurcated out, but it's also going to depend on the book sets that you have. Most of the time that I've actually done it, if, 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 if my clients have gone ahead and recorded their miscellaneous, if they recorded as miscellaneous income, I'm probably not going to change it. Um, but I'm going to show you sort of the different way that we would actually do this. And so instead of having it broken out here, What's going to happen is that I'm going to take this. So this miscellaneous income, it's 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 dividend and and um, and uh, interest income, but I'm going to break it out a little differently this time. So first of all, we've got. I want to make sure that I don't have anything in this AJE four column. So I don't. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of. Um, I'm going to get rid of this miscellaneous income that's here, and so there's the two thousand dollars. This time I'm going to go ahead and allocate $500 to interest income, and I'm going to allocate $1,500 to dividend income. Okay, so this is a reclassification. It should not have changed my net income at all, which it did not. And so, well, I mean, it did because I moved it. Well, no, it did not change my net income overall, but it's going to change how my uh, the character of my income. So I've gone ahead and I've done that. <clears throat> we have $500 for interest. We have $1,500 for dividend income. And what's going to end up happening here is, um, you know, say, for example, actually, let me bring this back. So on this $1,500 worth of dividend income, what kind of organizations are going to pay as dividend income? And that's generally going to be corporations. Now, from a tax perspective, you, you think you can kind of understand that if I, if I have income that a corporation earns, and we'll say that they earn um, you know, $100,000, they pay 21% on that, so it's $21,000. Then they go ahead and they dividend out that entire $100,000 to the other, to the next group of people. Then there, what's going to end up happening is that there is a, another tax 
for those individuals at 15% uh, if they're individuals. But assume that they're corporations. At corporations, if a corporation receives a dividend from another corporation without relief, they're going to have to pay another 21% on top of that. And then when that corporation dividends it out to another group of people or corporations, they're going to have to pay another level of tax on that. So there's a potential possibility that you could have triple, quadruple, or even quintuple taxable income unless there is a mitigation factor that allows you to, um, to reduce the overall tax rates on that. So what Congress came up with is they said, look, we're going to think, we come up with this thing called the dividends received deduction. Now, under the old rules, it was actually pretty easy. If you owned up to 20% of the company, you got a 70% dividends received deduction. Between 20 and 80%, you got an 80% dividends received deduction. And anything over 80, you got 100% off. So they, the, the recent Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, in order to raise funds, one of the things that they did is they changed the dividends received deduction rate. And they reduced it from, if you own less than 20% of the company, you get a 50% DRD. If you're between 20 and 80%, you get a 65% DRD. And if you own 80% or more of the company, you get 100% of the DRD. Now, how does this actually work within your organization? We're going to have to do an analysis of this $1,500 and find out where it came from. So let's say that it comes from a company that, you know, say it comes from our stock portfolio. You know, we have a little extra money. We've gone ahead and we've invested it in an, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a, an investment account. And as a result of that, we received this. So I'm going to get a 50% dividends received deduction off of this. And so I'm not going to have to pay taxes on that. So what would end up happening is I've, I've done my analysis. I realize that it's at 50%. So I'm going to take this. Divide it by two. And I think that makes a little bit of sense. So from a tax perspective, there I, I have a set I've reduced my income from fifteen hundred dollars down to seven hundred and fifty dollars. Now, where would I go to in order to be able to balance this? I would go this as non-deductibles. Now you might say, wait a minute, I thought this was a non-deductible expense. I call it non-deductibles because it can also be, you know, it can also re refer to non-taxable income. So what you can actually just modify this in order to get kind of sort of the overall um, mix on, on all of that. And so when you're taking a look at this, you've got net income of $6,500, uh, $65,000 in change. And then you've got $80,000 in change for box 10. And again, getting back to where this all goes into the tax return, you're going to put all of this um, onto the M1. Now, Another thing that's going to have to be filled out, if you do a dividends received deduction, you're also going to have to fill out this Schedule C. Schedule C for a corporation tax return will have dividends from less than 20%, so you'll have here, it would be $1,500, and special inclusions, which is going to be there, which is $750. Now, assuming that you don't have any of this other stuff, <coughs> Okay, you're going to have everything add up. And it's going to come all the way down, and you're going to have, okay, all your special inclusions in this case is going to be $750. Now, you also have all these different types of, um, these other different types of categories. We're not going to really talk too much about it. All of this stuff right here, FSCs, foreign source portions, 956, subpart F, that's all in, in this in this what we call guilty. That is all international tax related, and, and for the most part, most of you are probably never going to deal with it. Um, of course, I deal with it all the time because of because of the nature of my firm. But that's kind of where we stand on 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 all this. And then we have other dividends, and then Section two hundred and fifty deductions. Blah blah. Most of this you're probably not going to deal with on a on a on a day to day basis. If you are doing corporate tax returns professionally. Line one is probably where you're going to be putting in a lot of, of information. And the good news about it is um, the tax software, if it's used properly, will calculate a lot of this for you. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's not something that you should have to um, uh, spend an exorbitant amount of time on. 
Uh, but what will happen is once you've entered this in properly, more likely than not, your software will go to your Schedule M1 and input it correctly on the M1, assuming that the software does this automatically for you. There is some software out there, and I won't name the company, um, but it's not very automatic, shall we say. And so they're going to ask you, you're going to have to put it on on a special line, which says this is what my DRD is supposed to be for, for everything that I've got. And it's going to be an override number, but for some reason the software doesn't work right. But that's, that's how they're going to have to do it. And so pr from a practicality standpoint, that's how everything works out. Okay, so let's see. Actually, I want to go ahead I'm going to just minimize that. All right, so if I own 80% or more of the company, the DRD is going to be at 100%. And you might ask yourself, why is that? Well, from a, from a tax perspective, once you own 80% or more of the company, they don't tend to see those as separate entities any longer. It's really, they're, 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 they're basically two of the same entities. Now, um, I'll be honest with you, I, I, don't, I don't have a whole lot of experience with corporate taxation. Uh, but the very limited experience that I did have, I've only seen one consolidated entity at one point. Uh, it was at 100%. And so, of course, there, were, there was 100% DRDs for any dividends that they, they put between each other. And, and sort of the thought process on this is that, um, you know, if you want to pull the money out of the company, uh, what they don't want to have happen is people playing shell games uh, with, with all that stuff. And so, um, and so that, that's kind of why they do this DRD at 100%. It does create a permanent tax difference. You do not have to worry about this tax coming back to, to, to hit you later on in the future. So your regular tax liability, guys, you have no idea how easy it is. Um, I'll see if I can find something here real quick. Uh, I don't have it here. Uh, give me one second. Let me go show you. So, folks, this is the Small Business Quick Finder. I'll see if I can, um, uh, let's see, I'm going to stop sharing my screen real quick. I'm going to kind of show it up to you. This huge thing right here, that used to be your tax rate table that you used to have to follow. Looks very similar to, a, um, to the tax rates that they had for the, uh, for the individual. This is from 2013, and it was back in the day when... Um, yeah, so it was back in the day when, um, you know, when the, when the corporate tax rate could go as high as 40%. And the way it works out is, uh, you know, any, any, uh, if any taxable amount of income over, you know, a million dollars was, uh, was taxed at, um, at, at 40%. Now, in the, in the, you know, even back before the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, if you were a professional corporation, meaning you were doctors, lawyers, accountants, you know, all that sort of stuff, you had a flat tax rate at 35%. And that was something that it was not, um, yeah, so it, 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 what, what happened is, is that if you had the flat tax rate at 20, uh, you know, I'm sorry, flat tax at 35%, the reason why they did that is that, uh, generally speaking, doctors and lawyers make enough money that they're going to be at the max tax rates. And so they wanted to, to, to kind of have it to where they didn't, they didn't want the corporations to be doing a lot of funny business in order to reduce their overall rates and, and, and achieve a favorable rate just by playing games. So what ended up happening is um, they ended up bringing that out. And actually, I just realized something. Uh, what I shared with you actually was the estate and gift tax rate. I haven't looked at this in like months, but the, the, the corporate tax rate is very similar to that. And so it's, it's, it's something that... Uh, you know, it, it's, it, you know, luckily we don't have to deal with that anymore. Life is really good. Everything's flat tax rate at 21% applied to all taxable income. Nobody has to complain anymore. So on the compliance, again, you're going to file the 1120 uh, Schedule M1, M3. We've already talked about all that. Corporations are due uh, 
uh, corporation returns are due three and a half months after the close of the tax year. And that's, so if you have a calendar tax year, what ends up happening is um, that means that it's going to be a due on April 15th. And if you file a, an automatic five month extension, uh, you know, I'm sorry, if you file an automatic extension, it's going to get you out to, um, to October 15th uh, for calendar year corporations. Okay. Uh, consolidated returns are essentially treated as one corporation. That's, that's, that's actually very accurate. Well, we've talked about the M1. There's a good example if you want to see what one looks like. Um, that's obviously a little more comprehensive than what I've shown you. Um, you know, that's that. It, it, I mean, but it, you can you can read that if you've got any questions. You can ask me. Um, okay, so estimated payments. So corporations with a federal income tax liability five hundred dollars or more are required to pay their estimated taxes in quarterly installments. This is the same for individuals. Individuals have the exact same thing, except for instead of it being liability of five hundred dollars or more, it's um, if you have a, an additional one thousand dollars or more. So corporations have a little less um, leeway on this. Uh, so your installments are due on the fifteenth of the month, the fourth, sixth, ninth, and twelfth. Obviously, with the COVID nineteen going on, this first payment has actually been extended from April fifteenth all the way to um, to July fifteenth. The funny part about it all is, though, this this payment right here, the six month, has not been extended, and so you literally can have a situation where, um, you could have a situation where you actually have to pay your second quarterly month, uh, second quarterly installment before you have to pay your first quarterly installment. I don't. I think that if the federal government notices that this shutdown goes any longer than that was expected, or I mean, if it goes any longer than than uh, than to the end of May, they may actually extend this one out too, um, just because they know that people are going to be um, trying to make a make a sort of a better estimation as to how much the their their uh, bottom line has been affected. Um, I've been talking to a couple people who work in finance in the corporate world. Um, right now, the biggest issue is, you know, one of the things that they're all working on is what's our estimated quarterly tax uh, payments and what's our estimated quarterly income. But again, that's that's, you know, and, and, and when you have absolutely no idea when this COVID-19 thing is going to shut down, you know, you it's kind of hard to make that estimate. And so I, I think what's going to end up happening more likely than not, the government is probably going to extend this June, uh, you know, quarterly payment out probably about two months so they'll, they'll probably make it out either to august maybe make it to september but if they did that then they have to extend this you see how this kind of gets a little messy um I, I think they could do it uh but i think it's also going to depend upon um on how everything plays out so you may have a penalty if you do underpayments um you know this this what ends up happening is the software is going to calculate all that for you you don't have to worry about it and uh, but there's different methods of calculating this payment, um, but I'll save that for a little bit later on. So required annual tax payment, 100% of the liability on. Hmm. Excuse me. So 100% of tax liability on the prior year return. So what ends up happening? So say for example, you have a corporation that in 2018 had a, had a, you know $250,000 of tax liability. So you have two hundred fifty thousand dollars of tax liability divided by four. That means you had quarterly tax payments due a sixty-two thousand five hundred. So you make your first quarterly tax payment of sixty-two thousand five hundred, and then you get to June and you realize, wait a minute, our business is not going to do as well as we thought it would. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to make an estimate of how much uh, our our income is going to change. So instead of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You decide that it's going to be $150,000 less, so it's going to be at $100,000. Take that divided by four, that's $25,000. You've already made your quarterly tax payment for $62,500, so that's going to cover your first two tax payments very easily. Now, and the reason why we are able to do this is because it can be 100% of tax liability of the prior year, or it can be current, or it can be 100% tax 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 liability for the current year and when we say the current year we're talking about the year being filed so what ends up happening is um 
you know, if you, if you, if you, so if I make my quarterly payments and it equals a hundred percent of my current tax liability, I'm good to go. Now, why would they have this to where it could be court, current liability or prior year liability? Sometimes people don't have any clues to what their income is going to be until the very last minute. Very good example are retailers. Um, how is my income going to play out? I mean, how do I estimate what my net income is going to be when 40% of my net income that, that shows up comes in the month of December? So it's going to be very, very hard to make a, a good estimate on that. So in order to avoid uh, the, the tax liability, uh, the under withholding penalty, um, you know, Congress basically put in this exception and say, they say, said, look, if you do at least 100% of prior year liability, we're not going to worry about it. Now, if you don't have a prior year liability, your quarterly payment requirement was actually zero uh, in order to qualify under this exception. Now, my recommendation is not to do that because what will happen is when you file your tax return, you're going to have a huge liability that you're going to have to do because you didn't make any payments. And then on top of that, you also have to uh, consider making your first quarterly payment. And that's going to be the hard part for a lot of people is getting this caught up. Um, and one of the things that I've run into in the past is where I'm dealing with clients who, who have fallen behind and can't get caught up. And so that's just kind of the big thing. Um, so then 100% of the current year liability we talked about, 100% estimated current year tax liability using annualized method. Now, like I said, there's different ways that we can calculate this penalty here. Um, what ends up happening is that there's an annualized method. And so if you have a corporation where they receive um, income sort of, shall we say, unevenly um you know this this estimate right here that we have the the 25 percent due here 50 percent 75 percent due that's making an assumption that the corporation is is receiving their money over uh, evenly over the entire year which of course there's a lot of business very good examples accounting businesses uh roughly about 40 to 50 percent of my gross income that i receive um is done in the first three months of the year first three four months of the year um, and then, you know, w once you get it out to about May, I've probably earned about, you know, 60 to 70 percent of my income that I'm going to make for that year. So what ends up happening is a a an accounting firm is probably not a good example for this. But I would say a retailer is a very good example for doing this, because if you can kind of show that, hey, look, in our first quarter, uh, first quarter for a retailer is January, February, March. You're probably not going to be making a whole lot of money as a retailer. Uh, and I'm talking, you know, like clothing retailers and things of that nature, because usually holiday spending is where they're going to make most of their money. Now, they may make a little bit of money around Valentine's Day, but it's not going to be significant compared to the rest of the year. Um, then once you get to April, May, June, spring starts coming out, people go out more often. People are going to be willing to go out and spend more money. Um, and then once you get to the, the second three months, which is uh, July, August, September, that's the end of summer. A lot of your retailers are going to be making okay money at that point. Um, but once you hit uh, October, November, December, December is where they're going to be making the majority of their money. And when I say majority, I'm talking 40% of their gross revenues usually happen. In the, uh, you know, basically, and there, you know, most of you have probably heard the term Black Friday. Black Friday is, you know, it's the first, it's basically the first day of the year where the, where the, where the, um, uh, where most retailers expect to be in the black, which is why they call it Black Friday, instead of being in the red, which means that they uh, that they're that they're losing money, and so Black Friday is kind of seen as that that first day where they're expected to be in the in the black, and so because they're making all that money towards the end of the year, an annualization method might be able to save them on penalties. Um, Again, this is something I, I've only done this on a couple clients once or twice. Um, you know, we can kind of take a look at it and see how it works out. But um, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. My recommendation is if you got a client who, who's getting, who's looking at a significant underwithholding penalty, run all three methods, see which one works um, to get them the least amount of penalty. So rules for corporations: million dollars taxable income per year, three years, may use prior liability for its first quarter payment only. In other words, the thought process is, look, if you've got a million dollars or more of taxable income, you probably have a sophisticated enough accounting staff that should be able to do the estimates on this stuff. And, uh, and so they're going to expect they're going to hold you to a higher level. 
Okay, so estimated payments. Um, you know, this is this is this is how they kind of uh, how they figure out the uh, the estimated taxable income computation of the annualized income method. Uh, you know, again, the computer's going to do this all for you. I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about this. All right, so that's the end of chapter sixteen. So moving on to chapter eighteen. First of all, any questions about chapter 16 before I move on? All right. Hearing none, I'll move on. All right. So corporate non-liquidating dividends. Okay. So when I was setting up this course, there's two different types of dividends of distributions that we, that we have in, in corporate taxation overall. One of them is going to be called a non-liquidating distribution. The other one's a liquidating distribution. Liquidating distributions, basically, I'm shutting down the company and I'm about to hand out all the assets. When I was sitting there thinking about this course and I was trying to choose chapters we were going to go over, uh, the first question that I came to my mind was, what are you going to see more often than not? And so when I started looking at this, I said, you know, we, we could do liquidating corporation distributions. I think you're going to spend more time dealing with non-liquidating distributions than you are dealing with liquidating distributions. Um, liquidating distributions on this, uh, the, under uh, code section, I believe it's 33, uh, 331, 332. Um, there's a process that you have to follow. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about it. The majority of the time, if you have a liquidating corporation, you as the staff are probably not going to be dealing with it at that time. And I would hope that if you end up taking a master's degree, in, in, in the accounting world, I would hope you do a master's in tax, but if you did a master's in tax, I mean, I remember we did, um, it was an entire two week of our course where we talked about liquidating corporate distributions um, and how they get taken care of. Um, very fascinating, very interesting stuff. Probably not something that, uh, you know, probably not something that you're going to see um, very frequently um, in your stuff. So the non-liquidating distributions, you're going to see a lot. And what is a liquid? What is a non-liquidating distribution? Many people will use the terms distributions and dividends interchangeably, and you're going to learn in this chapter that's not the case. Um, dividends apply to a specific type of distribution. All dividends are distributions. Not all distributions are dividends, and I'll and I'll kind of show how that how that makes sense later on. Okay, so distributions to shareholders will be taxed in one of the following rates. One is taxes income. And they say tax is a lower rate. Depends, but we'll 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 talk in a minute. Tax-free return of capital, and then taxes capital gains. So if you think about it this way, if I have a corporation, and if that corporation, you know, I mean, if, and if you think about it from this perspective, what is a dividend? What is a dividend? It's basically a distribution from corporate profits. Okay. So if you have corporate profits and you want to send some of that money to the owners of the company in order to make your company more valuable, because one of the reasons why you pay dividends is because you want you want your shareholders, the people who are investing their money in your corporation, taking this huge amount of risk for your business, you want to reward them for that risk. And so one of the ways you can reward them is by having appreciation of the stock value, which the way you do that is that you run the company successfully. The second way that you do this is that you hand them cash. Um, if, if, if I told everybody in this class, Hey, by the way, I'm going to hand out a hundred dollar bill. If you guys, um, go out there and rate me as the best professor ever, you're probably going to be very happy to do it. Um, it, it's, it's not considered bribery in that sense. It's, you know, you know, in, in the sense of the corporation, but it is one of those things that, Hey, if I want you to be loyal as shareholders and happy as shareholders, handing you guys free money is a good way to do that. And so this is, this is, you know, and I, I shouldn't say free money because obviously they're going to pay taxes on it. Um, but second of all, they've, they've handed you um, a lot of money. Now, most of the time when you take dividends rates and what they're going to do is they're going to say, you know, um, you know, what's your, what's your, how much your dividend is versus how much you paid for the stock. Um, generally it's going to be, you know, I mean, most dividends that I've seen, you know, I've, I've seen them as low as, you know, half a percent, 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%, 6%, 7%, 8%, 9%, 10%, 11%, 12%, 13%, 14%, 15%, 16%, 17%, 18%, 19%, 
Um, I've seen them as high as six, seven percent. Um, the ones that tend to be very high, usually at about five to six percent, um, usually tend to be bank stocks because they're making a lot of money and they want to hand it out to their to, to their shareholders. Um, Japanese bank stocks specifically. Um, I used to be invested in a in a company called Mitsui Bank. Um, Mitsui is, is, is one of the large banking conglomerates over in Japan. They used to pay historically around five, six percent in, in dividends, um, which, which, was, which was good. The, the bad news about them is capital appreciation never happened. Uh, pretty much the stock stayed even, well, because the company's been around for almost 400 years, so it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, but it's a reliable dividend that you can actually be paid out. Now, the, because it was a dividend to me, it was taxed as income. At, in my case, it was definitely at a lower rate than, than ordinary income would have been because I got preferential capital gains treatment. Now, if, I, if I'm a corporation and say, for example, instead of me paying you a distribution from earnings and profits, I hand out cash in excess of my, uh, my earnings and profits, that's going to be handed to, to you as a tax-free return of capital. So the way the IRS looks at it is, I buy the stock for $100, the company makes per share, um, we'll say, you know, $3. They decide to hand out a dividend at $5 per share. Well, there's the $3 that, um, that, that, that it earned, that it returned to me as a dividend, but the $2 in excess of that is going to be returned to me as a tax-free return of capital. And that's because I paid $100 for that share. I have $100 of quote-unquote basis, if you want to think of it that way. So the $2 that they return to me is going to be a reduction of that $100 down to 2, um, by 2 to 98. And so it's going to be a tax-free return of capital. Obviously, if I paid for that and you give it back to me, I'm not going to pay taxes on that. That, that, would, be, that would be ludicrous and, and ridiculous. So it's going to be a tax-free return of capital. Now, let's take that same example. I buy something for $100 a share. And then they 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 get, they earn three dollars worth of income, but they decide to pay a hundred and five dollars in um in, in dividends. What ends up happening is, is that the first three you know first three dollars is taxed to me as a distribution of income, so it'll be to me it'll be taxed as income. The hundred dollars following that is going to be returned to taxed to me as a tax free return of capital, and then the two dollars beyond that is going to be taxed as a it's basically going to be a distribution in excess of, 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 of cost basis, which is going to be taxed to me at capital gains rates. From a tax perspective, it's almost like tax of capital gains rates. Whoops, sorry. Tax of capital gains rates, refer, tax free return of capital, and then tax of capital gains rates. It doesn't look like it's a whole lot, but these are actually three separate things that are actually happening at that time. And then... Um, you know, again, once they've returned all my capital to me, if they ever have, you know, d d income taxed, um, if, if they ever do a distribution in excess of earnings and profits, this, the, you know, this taxes capital gains is going to happen almost immediately because the return of capital won't um, won't take place. So when they're taxed to shareholders, this creates double taxation of corporate income. And, and the way that kind of works out, let's see if I've got an extra... I got book three here. Okay, so this is a blank Excel sheet. So if you think about it, and I have here, you know, a corporation makes a hundred. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't even need to put it in I have an extra zero on there. So it makes a hundred thousand dollars of income. They're going to pay a point two one percent of income t tax on that. So it's going to be ten percent times twenty one percent. I'm sorry, ten hundred thousand dollars times twenty one thousand dollars so then what's going to happen is is that i'm going to have seventy nine thousand dollars left over say i take that seventy nine thousand dollars and then i distribute it to me now i'm going to have it at a 15 percent tax rate and actually let me blow this up here a little bit let's see we can get this here that probably is a little easier to see i assume um actually put this as a percentage and then I'm going to pay, so so I had $100,000 of income that was taxed 21%. Federal government gives $21,000. So 
$79,000 then gets distributed to me as a dividend because we're going to distribute all profits to the, to the owners and say I'm the sole owner of the company. I'm going to pay a tax rate of 15% on that. Oops. And so there's going to be an 11,880, I'm sorry, 850. And the total on the, on the tax on that is going to be 32,850 with an effective tax rate of 33%. Now, this is only at federal level. This is not at the state level. And so, so there's certain things that we that, that add kind of add to this, but you can see how this 21% is not really a 21%. It, it's actually potentially a 33%. Now, the corporation could have not given me this money, and instead it could have spent it on additional things, new software, new furniture, new other things that would allow it to be deductible, and then there wouldn't be this additional tax on it. But as a shareholder, maybe that you know my my goal of investing in this company is I want to make money off of it. And so that's that's kind of how this works out. OK. So that's kind of how this whole thing works out. Now, they say some payments to shareholders are deductible to the corporation to pay an initial payment. So, for example, if instead of dividends, I have bonds, the, the, the interest that's going to be on there is going to be a deduction. So it is. So, for example, kind of getting back at this. Um, See if I can get that back up. Kind of getting at this. If instead of sending this out as a distribution, if it was an interest payment instead, the corporation would have gotten a full blown deduction off of this. So, say for example, uh, you know, instead of that, you know, maybe instead I have. Um, I'm trying to think here. Let's see. Insert. So I have an interest payment that gets paid to me of twenty thousand dollars. Maybe I've loaned the company, you know, uh, you know how much ever it is. We'll say we'll say like three four hundred thousand dollars or whatever, and they pay me an interest payment of twenty percent or twenty thousand dollars. What will happen is okay, I would actually have the twenty thousand dollars, but. The tw but, but but what would happen is is that this twenty one percent would no longer be on the twenty on the hundred thousand dollars, it would be on the reduced income of 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 um of eighty thousand dollars, and that would be B four minus twenty the twenty thousand dollars, and so that's going to reduce the tax rate uh, significantly. So if I if I pay myself eighty th twenty thousand dollars, and then I dividend myself out the rest. My total distribution from this company would be at eighty three thousand two hundred dollars, okay, and so the overall corporate tax rate would be at twenty six percent. So you see how it's more advantageous for the corporation to pay out interest rather than paying out uh, dividends. And so what ends up happening is that's why some corporations will still use bonds in order to do things. Now, one of the bad news about bonds. It's guaranteed. You have to pay that interest out, whether you want to or not. If you if you have a uh, a contingency put on that, then it you know the IRS can come back and say, well, we're not. That's not really an interest payment. Maybe a dividend payment, and so they can recharacterize this sort of stuff. And so um, now, for me as the as the corporate as, as the shareholder, how does this get taxed to me? So I have sixty three thousand dollars, which is taxed at fifteen percent, but then I have this other twenty thousand dollars, which is going to be taxed at um, you know, it's going to be taxed to me at whatever my ordinary tax rates are. And if I'm earning this kind of money out of here, it's probably going to be at about 24%. So maybe I pay 24%. Whoops. All right. Equals this times 0.24. So I'm going to pay $4,800 in taxes plus 94.80. So my total taxes that I'm going to pay personally on this, uh, on this money would be 14,280. The corporation's taxes that they're going to end up paying would be sixteen thousand dollars. We still would end up paying a significant amount of money. So, um, actually, let me see if I can do this here, and I'll see if I can get a a number on this. So that's my taxes that's going to be paid. So, the taxes that the company and the corporation pay together—I'm sorry, the shareholder and the corporation pay together—is going to be thirty thirty-one thousand eighty dollars. 
But if you take a look at this and divide that by the original $100,000 to get the effective tax rate, well, it's still less than 33%, but not by much. So the more that you try to structure some of this stuff out, the more it's going to, uh, to change your tax rates. Now, something else that they say here, it may not necessarily be in, in, in interest. I, I don't have any control over how much interest I'm going to pay. It's going to be based on whatever my, my, my bonds or my corporate loan agreements are going to be. But if I did payments for services, salary, can I decide to increase or decrease my salary if I'm the sole owner of the company? Sure, I can pay myself whatever I want, uh, as long as I have the means to pay the salary and the, and, and the IRS allows me to take the deduction. Um, so I have a lot more freedom in terms of my salary than I do of my interest. Now, the use of property, which is rent, this is actually something that we use um, here with a lot of our clients that are corporate clients. Uh, I have a lot of corporate clients that they want to rent um, an office space from their, from their house. You can legally do this under what's called self-rentals. Self-rental allows you to do the, um, the rent of, 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 of a per part of your a property that you actually own. Now, if the corporation rents that from a related entity, it could face increased scrutiny by the IRS, um, but there's also some additional rules that you have to follow. And we've talked about the rental, uh, rental properties. Um, there's actually a different category of rental properties called self-rentals. That's when you're renting it to a related party or you're renting it to to yourself, um, there's sort of some different rules that play into to, 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 to that case. But it is a way to be able to take money out of a corporation, uh, not subject to self-employment tax. Remember, rental income is not subject to self-employment tax. And, 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 and get it out there without any major issues. All right? So to be deductible, payments to the shareholders must be reasonable amounts. In other words, you can't have your home office being rented out at $100,000 a month, okay, unless you, unless you, you know, own the entire Waldorf Astoria in New York City. Um, you know, you, you, they have to be reasonable, and usually what will end up happening is uh, a very good example for what we do for most of our clients is we contact the local Regis office and we say, okay, Regis, how much would you rent a one-room one office to us for? Oh, we charge $1,000 a month. Okay, so that's what we use for our rent um, for most of our clients. And so um, from there, we're actually able um, to, to, to meet the deductibility uh, requirements of this that, that fair market value. Okay? So this is where we get into the fun of this chapter, and that's where we start talking about earnings and profits. Uh, as you learned in financial accounting, uh, you, you know, when you do a, dis, a distribution from, from a corporation to your um, fellow um, uh, owners, uh, you know, it's going to be coming from profits, uh, earnings and profits. In, in a tax perspective, there's actually uh, earnings and profits is a very significant number that has to be tracked and followed, uh, particularly for a, a lot of your, uh, your corporations. Now, some, some CPA firms are going to be better at doing this than others. I've worked with some CPA firms. They don't even bother with calculating earnings and profits until it becomes a problem. Um, my recommendation is if you do, you know, it's, it's kind of like um, if I eat the elephant uh, one bite at a time over a, a four-year period, uh, assuming that the, the, the elephant wouldn't rot, um, it's going to be a much easier thing to do than if I have to eat an elephant within one day. Um, basically what ends up happening is I think if you do a little work now every year, it kind of saves you a little bit. Um, but sometimes clients don't want to pay for that. And if they don't want to pay for it, that's their problem. Um, again, we have to have sort of that sort of, uh, brought into, and I think that part of the way that you can kind of solve some of this is by making sure that the engagement letter is written correctly. Uh, which is something that uh, I think a lot of firms don't spend as much time on engagement letters as they would like to. So dividend distributions are included in the shareholder's gross income. Uh, Non-dividend distributions are return of capital, and we've already talked about all this. Um, but that's why it's important to have a correct earnings and profits calculated because you got to figure out how much of this is going to be determined as a distribution that's going to be a dividend and how much of it is going to be a non-dividend return of capital, okay? Dividend for tax, for tax purposes is distribution of property made by, cor by corporation to its shareholders out of earnings and profits. 
There's two separate accounts that must be maintained. You have current earnings and profits and accumulated earnings and profits. Um, as an international tax person, I know the AEMP is a very important number. Got to make sure that one's calculated correctly. So if you guys ever have a burning to go into international tax, uh, accumulated earnings and profits is a very important number in order to make sure that we calculate correctly. So uh, computing CEMP begins with taxable income. Taxable income is adjusted by the following. So you're going to include in EMP certain excluded income. You're going to disallow some deductions that do not require an economic outflow. And you're going to deduct certain expenses that require an economic outflow but are not deducted for calculating taxable income and adjust the timing for certain um, uh, for certain deductions in income because certain methods of accounting are required in, for computing EMP. What this all means uh, in the bottom line of everything is that you're going to have EMP, your CEMP is going to, is, it's basically going to be how much you, how much taxable income that you paid plus or minus certain deductions and you're going to, and we're going to go over those here. All right, the template 18-1, uh, we'll talk about it here in a second. And you notice in the past, I don't normally, I blow past a lot of the exhibits. I'm going to actually use the exhibit 18-1 on this one. It's actually one of the better ones. So the taxable income uh, or net operating loss, you add the exclusions from taxable income. So for example, if you earn $20,000 of taxable bond interest, that's income. The, 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 the government had an opportunity to tax it. It didn't tax it for whatever reason. So that's not your fault. So you get to add that in as, as income that's potentially subject to distribution. Uh, life insurance proceeds. Now, now let's back up a little bit. Now, think of it this way. Tax-exempt bond interest. Say, for example, I have, uh, a, you know, I form a corporation and I decide to, uh, to invest in tax-exempt bonds, um, but then I want to pay myself a distribution. Does that make sense? It shouldn't make any sense because you're basically you're taking tax exempt bond interest and turning it into taxable income, which is ludicrous. Um, you know, obviously we would do this if it was something that was helpful for the corporation as an overall investing strategy. But I mean, obviously you wouldn't want to form a corporation to do this. Now, if you do have a, um, a cor you want to form this and put it into some kind of protected entity, my recommendation would actually be a trust. But we're not going to go into that. But, you know, I, I've, I've seen where there's family partnerships that do um, sort of some investments. And then what happens is you have various family members that are part of the partnership. Um, that's something that, uh, that that can grow over time. And so it's very valuable and very important. Uh, you have life insurance proceeds. Uh, life insurance proceeds. So if you receive life insurance from the death of key members that was exempt from taxation, you can add that in as, as something that's potentially deductible. Again, not an over, you know, I've never recommended to my clients that death be an overall, um, uh, you know, well, well, let me back up. I was going to make that as a joke, but actually it turned out it was going to be accurate. How you plan for death is important in tax strategy. I don't recommend using death as a way of getting out of taxes, of course. Um, but that said, we're all going to die at some point. You want to make sure that you're, you're, you're planning everything accordingly so that you can, so that, um, um, so that the taxation of, of those um, can all take place accordingly. Uh, life insurance, pro, uh, sorry, sorry, federal tax refunds, if they're a cash basis taxpayer, and then the increase in cash surrender value of corporate-owned life insurance policies as need be. Uh, you're also going to add deductions not allowed for tax purposes, which is the DRD. Um, so if you receive uh, dividends that just didn't get subject to tax, obviously that's still going to be income that's, that's subject to being able to be distributed to, um, to, your, uh, to your shareholders. Your annual de deduction carrybacks and forwards, uh, net, operate, you know, net capital loss forwards, and then of course any contrib charitable contribution carry forwards. You're going to subtract the deductions allowed for EMP purposes but not for tax purposes. Federal income taxes paid or accrued, expenses of earned income uh, earning tax exempt income, uh, you know. So, for example, if I if I pay a um, an investment company um, money to manage my tax exempt uh, bonds, what ends up happening is, is that that normally would not be a deductible expense, but it is something that does get subtracted for EMP because if I'm going to let you add in um, items for tax exempt income. 
you're also going to have to include the expenses that took in order to earn that income. Current your char uh, charitable contribution in excess of the 10% limitation. Uh, you know, then you're going to have penalties and fines and things of that nature. So if you think about it, if I if I if I'm a corporation and I have you know drivers who are required to go downtown DC, a very common thing that's going to happen is they're going to get parking tickets left, right, up, and down because that's the way DC works. Um, you know, penalties and fees, fines for that are not deductible for tax purposes, but they're probably going to be deductible um, for EMP purposes. And then it's also the deductible portion of meal expenses and all this other stuff. So we're not going to worry about that. Timing differences due to separate accounting methods for taxable income and EMP. <coughs> Remember, EMP is, is going to be calculated on an accrued basis. Uh, taxable income for cash basis taxpayers is going to be a little bit different, and so we have to make sure that we get that taken care of. Uh, yeah, carrying charges, we, we've heard about those in the news. And then uh, capitalized first year expenses, increasing the life or recapture. We didn't talk about increasing the life or recapture amount, and we probably won't just for um, a, a variety of reasons. Order and distributions of EMP and, deter and determining dividend income. You have positive current EMP, positive accumulated EMP. Uh, and, and, and this is kind of the way that they're going to do this ordering. We'll talk about this when we get to the example. Um, Okay, so one question they have here. You have current EMP for um for your uh for your of a million dollars, your accumulated EMP is negative five hundred thousand dollars. Corporation distributes a million bucks. Is the div what is the dividend to any of the shareholders? I would argue that it's gonna be a dividend. Okay, so basically what they're doing is C, C EMP is negative, but A EMP is positive. The net EMP is a portion on a per daily basis, blah, 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 500,000. And so the amount of da, 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 Oh, I thought they would have gone more into that. Yeah, that would be my thought. Oh, oh, I see what's going on. So what is the, oh, okay. I thought I thought this was, this is example two. Um, so my recommendation is basically it, it's 100% dividend, okay? Sorry, I didn't read that right. Example number two, current EMP is negative. Accumulated EMP is, is positive, what happens. So again, it's going to be portioned on a per day basis. And so AEMP as of July 1st, 1 million divided by uh, minus 100, you know, um, minus one half of the million dollars that I had in the AEMP. That means it's going to be $500,000. So what will end up happening is, Five hundred thousand dollars of it is going to be seen as um, uh, as a dividend, and the other five hundred thousand dollars is going to be a return to capital, uh, or potentially uh, could be a capital gain depending on how much they paid for the stock. Distributions of non-cash property to shareholders. So, for example, if in, if if I'm owner of a of a of a, of a corporation, I don't have any cash, but I want to pay myself a dividend. Maybe I take one of the cars that's sitting outside and I say, look, this car isn't making me any money anymore. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to dividend it out to one of my shareholders. Um, and so what ends up happening is maybe I give cash to, uh, you know, maybe there's two shareholders, each own 50-50. So I'm going to give cash to one shareholder, give the fair market value of the car um, to the other shareholder. Then what's going to end up happening is that, you know, we have to kind of, uh, you know, decide on that. But for example, say I'm the only shareholder and I have distribution of non-cash. So if I pay money to the corporation plus the fair market value of other property received minus the liabilities assumed, it's going to be the amount distributed. Um, you know, this happens uh, very infrequently. Normally, it's going to happen with corporations that are owned by maybe one, maybe two people at the most. Um, so you're going to see this as, as small corporations. I probably won't ask you this on a test just because, uh, you know, it, it's not going to be something that we run into very often, but, um, but, but I wouldn't worry too much about this. Tax consequences to corporation paying non-cash property as a dividend. Okay, so the corporation recognizes gains and not losses. So, for example, if I have that car that I go ahead and distribute and I pay $10,000 for it and the fair market value of the car is actually $5,000, 
there's no loss that I'm going to be able to recognize on it. However, uh, the corporation will have to recognize any gains if I distribute it and it turns out that it's a gain. This you're going to see more often than not on real property that's distributed. Maybe I dividend out a piece of land that originally we bought as a corporation for $10,000. It's now worth $100,000. I distributed it out. Gain is going to be recognized to the extent of fair market value and excess of tax base of the property, which in that case, I bought it for 10, dividended it out for 100. There's going to be $90,000 of, um, of distributions that I've seen. Uh, I mean, of gain that I saw on the, on the distributions. So liabilities, if the property's fair market value is less than the liabilities, assume fair market value is determined to be the liability. So for example, if I have a piece of land that I bought for say $100,000 and I borrowed money against it, all of a sudden we find out it's a toxic dump. Now the fair market value of that land goes from $100,000 down to $10,000. I still owe say $90,000 on that and I distribute that out to the shareholder because we're just we're going to get it off our corporate books. We're going to give it back to the shareholder who maybe originally sold it to us for the, in the first place before they realized it was a toxic dump. Um, the liabilities on that is going to be the fair market value of that land. So I would have to use the $90,000, even though it's only worth um, $10,000. So shareholder, uh, <laughs> shareholder, that's funny. Um, I guess most of you who probably, you probably don't even know who share is, so I won't. Uh, and Sunny Corporation, share and Sunny, yeah, okay. If you were raised in the 19th, 80s and 70s, uh, you know, I was born in the 70s, but uh, Sonny and Cher, of course, uh, well, actually, you may know who Cher is. Maybe she's still popular enough, but Sonny was her husband, and, and of course, they, uh, they, they, they were a singing duet that, uh, you know, they eventually got divorced. I think Sonny ended up being a congressman uh, in, in California, uh, from California for a long time, and, of course, Cher just, you know, just, you know, does her singing thing. Anyways. So shareholder receives property from distribution from Sunny Corporation uh, with fair market value of $200. Share assumes $100 mortgage. Attached to the property, Sunny's basis of the property is distributed is, is $100. Sunny reports a gain of $100 on the distribution, $200 minus the $100,000 that he bought it for. Um, so that's, that's kind of how this ends up working out. Now we're going to say, okay, so shareholder receives a property distribution from Sunny Corporation, the fair market value of $200. Share assumes a $300 mortgage attached to the property. Sunny's basis in the property is $100. Uh, Sunny Corporation reports a gain of $200 because it's $300 of the mortgage attached to the fair market value minus the $100 that they, that they did on this. The property's fair market value is determined to be the amount because the liability exceeds the property's fair market value. Again, this might be one of those things where Sunny Corporation realized maybe, you know, instead of it being, you know, and, and, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a toxic waste dump. It could also be, you know, and I'm just going to use this because Sunny and Cher actually used to live out in Orange County, Los Angeles. One of the famous things that they found out at in Los Angeles is the La Brea Tar Pits, which is where, um, you know, they, they were excavating for some uh, dinosaur remains. You know, you find out that the piece of land that you've got is is actually a tar pit um, that you didn't know about before. All of a sudden, you can't build anything on that because, you know, the government wants to use that land in order to do some excavation to see if they can find dinosaur bones. Um, you can, you, you, you know, they'll, they'll probably come in and they'll take the land. But maybe before you do that, you want to go ahead and dividend it out to... Um, uh, you know, to the shareholder in order to get that taken care of. So, th so there's various reasons why you would want to distribute land that has depreciated in value since you originally uh, borrowed against it. All right, stock distribution. So very common thing. So we've been talking about cash distributions and then uh, fair market value of, um, of non-cash assets. But say, for example, I'm a shareholder of a corporation uh, Mitsui would be a good one. I'll just use them because uh, I've used them in the past. And and Mitsui comes to us and says, you know what? We want to issue out a dividend. We really don't have any cash this time. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to issue out a stock dividend. So you, they could take the, you know, div stock dividends could either take the form of a stock split or it could just be increased number of shares. Uh, usually, uh, there, it's, it, well, in order for a stock distribution to be non-taxable, it has to be uh, these two following conditions. 
made with respect to common stock and pro rata, <laughs> meaning that if if I own a thousand shares and they say, look, for everyone who owns a thousand shares, we're going to give you ten additional shares. This this is actually made. This is actually um um you know it, it's actually um it would be a tax tax exempt distribution. Now, say for example, I own preferred shares of Mitsui Bank, and they said, hey, look. We're going to do. We're going to issue out all preferred shareholders who own. Yeah, for every stock that you, for every one share that you own in preferred stock, we're going to give you one share of common stock. Um, we no longer are making that with with respect to common stock, even though it does meet the pro rata. It does not. It, it, actually, it wouldn't meet the pro rata because what would end up happening is proportionate interest would not be maintained. But if it was done by by um, preferred shares, then it wouldn't work out that way. It would be a taxable event. Basically, I'd have to pay taxes on the fair market value of the shares received. Okay, so if you have stock received over adjusted basis of old stock, you know, this, this is kind of the formulation so that you can figure out what the adjusted basis of the new stock is. The good news is, more likely than not, you're not going to have to calculate this unless you're working with a company that doesn't do its job, which is entirely possible. Um, but generally speaking, they're gonna they're gonna calculate this for you, so you don't have to worry too much about that. All right. So as you can see, stock redemptions is gonna be a one of eleven. This is gonna probably take us to the end of this slide deck, anyways. So I'm gonna go ahead and we'll um, end class a couple minutes early. But did you have any questions for me before we end class today? Is everyone finding the videos and is 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 are the videos uh, that I'm posting helpful? Okay. Well, I'll make sure that we keep doing that. So so people are going back and wa re watching this stuff. All right. Fair enough. I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll keep up with that then. All right, folks. I'm going to go ahead and stop recording at this time.